Hello YouTube. This is a response to a video put out on December 10th, 2011 on a YouTube channel called Christ Has Returned. The channel belongs to a man who, according to information published on his own website, is named Raymond Elwood. I've been keeping a watch on what Mr. Elwood has been up to for the past six months or so after someone passed on a link to his website. And the reason for that, as you might have gathered from his YouTube username, is that he's claiming to be the second coming of Christ. And backed by a secretive organization that you may have heard about in passing called the Knights Templar. I've been watching the videos he's been putting out every three or four weeks with some amusement, but also a certain amount of interest. He isn't the first man to have made the claim, he joins a long list, but he's probably the first to have made use of social media in an attempt to build a following. He's on Twitter, and he's also now on Google+. As a Christian, this phenomenon is of special interest because we're told very clearly to watch out for it. The Bible is a compilation of separate books, and we normally talk about it having two parts, which are closely interrelated. These are the Old and the New Testaments. One of the books of the New Testament is called the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel meaning the Good News. In one chapter of that book, chapter 24, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, who are his followers, and they ask him, What shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? His reply to them is critically important. The very first thing he says to them is, Take heed, let no man deceive you. He then continues, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. A bit further on in the chapter he says, And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. In another of the New Testament books, called the Book of Mark, where the same discussion is recorded, in this case in chapter 13, Jesus says, For false Christs and false prophets shall rise, and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Here and throughout the Bible, this word elect, or the elect, is used to describe God's people, his church. So we're warned very explicitly that a point in time will arrive when certain individuals will come forward and make this claim. And they will gain prominence, and a lot of people will be taken in by them. Even some Christians who should be aware of these deceptions will be vulnerable to them. Furthermore, we're told that they will show signs and wonders. In other words, that they'll be capable of performing what are apparently supernatural feats. Going back for a moment to the book of Matthew, we're given a description of the real events surrounding Christ's second coming. Again in chapter 24 it says, For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now Jesus was born on earth as a human male, so he's often referred to by that term, the Son of Man, and so too are other men and humankind. But he was also born the Son of God, so in other places he's referred to in that way, reflecting these two aspects of his character. And again from the book of Mark, from this same conversation with his disciples, Jesus says, But in those days, after that tribulation, and I'll just break into that quote there and say that I've continued from a point beyond the description of this period, which will be known as the Tribulation, a time of terrible hardship, which, we'll talk, which we're told will also take place before Christ returns. So going back to the quote, The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. 
And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. This will be an unmistakable event. Jesus won't return to earth unseen. It won't be by thumbing messages on a mobile phone to update his Twitter status to let you know that he's here. It's not going to be a repeat performance. He came to earth. He conquered the world by overcoming all temptation and by the sacrifice of his life. When he returns, it'll be from above and you will know about it. The scope for having a look at every video Mr. Elwood has put out so far, including the installment Gold, Human Sacrifice, Slavery, where he gives us his version of historical events, which curiously very closely follows the alien Anunnaki story you'll often come across on conspiracy forums. Amazingly, he writes about lesser gods who are shortly to arrive, or have arrived, on Earth in spaceships to collect the gold that we should all have been mining for them as their purpose-created slave race. There's a lot you could say about that, but one of the things that I want to emphasize is that Christianity, fundamentally, is a monotheistic religion, which means that it teaches that there is one God. This is a basic, central tenet. And yet here he's talking about God and the subordinate lesser gods. In his doctrine, the only reason we're kept around and alive is so that we can serve as a manual labour workforce to extract gold for this collection of deities. But the main issues that I want to address in this video, because there's something he spent a lot of time on in his most recent production, are the Freemasons, Masonic Symbolism, and the Knights Templar. What I'm going to do is to show you some segments of a video lecture series that was recorded in 2007. It's a lecture series that takes a very detailed look at the Bible, at prophecy in the Bible, that's the prediction of future events, and about our place in the timeline, where we are in the sequence of events laid out in the Bible. It investigates how what is happening at the moment in the world relates to these events, and it looks at what is going to happen in the future. There are 22 lectures in this series, and they're all presented by a man called Mark Woodman. He devotes a lot of time in these lectures to talking about secret societies and the influences that these societies have on government and culture. And he speaks extensively about the Freemasons and the history of that organisation. If you haven't watched Mr. Elwood's video, and I should say that he has styled himself Lord Rael, that's R-A-E-L, which he says is a contraction of his first and second names, but of course Ra, R-A, is the Egyptian sun god, and L means god or of god. If you haven't seen his video from December the 10th, then it would make sense to go and do that first. I've selected a set of clips from several of Mark Woodman's lectures where he speaks about the Freemasons, and it's that group of clips that I'm going to show you. So if you notice that there's a break in the continuity, for, it's for that reason I'm putting together segments from four different lectures. And I would say that please, if you're someone who has seen the videos by Mr. Elwood, and you're wondering whether this is someone you should be giving your time, money, and energy to, watch these video clips and then decide whether you want to associate yourself with a man who endorses the people and organisations that they speak about. I invite you to go and have a look at the complete lecture series from the very beginning. If you're a Christian, or you're just curious about Christianity, I think this will give you a new perspective, and it really touches on a lot of fascinating topics. The depth of research is staggering, and there's a lot of information here about conspiracy that I haven't heard anywhere else. I'll include a link to his blog, which has the addresses of all the lectures on YouTube. Morals and Dogma is a book which will be mentioned quite regularly throughout the rest of this lecture, and some of those to come for that matter. Albert Pike was an interesting gentleman. He wrote a book called Morals and Dogma, which I'll show you in a later lecture, is the book you receive when you become a Shriner Freemason. 
A Shriner Freemason being the, 30, the 33rd degree Freemason is the one who receives the Shriner cap. Remember that a shrine is a temple. So this is a type of high priest of the shrine or a high priest of the temple. How does this fit in? Let's go to that Morals and Dogma book of the ancient and accepted Scottish writer written by Albert Pike himself. And he'll tell us that the Templars were gravely accused of spitting upon Christ and denying God at their receptions of gross obscenities, conversations with female devils and a worship of a monstrous idol. He continues on page 817. The Templars, now listen to this, like all other secret orders and associations had two doctrines. One concealed and reserved for the masters which was known as Johannism. That's the inside esoteric hidden one called Johannism. The other which is public which was Roman Catholic. Albert Pike is explaining here as the, the pinnacle of Freemasonry. The, the most influential person in the history of Freemasonry, who wrote the Bible of Freemasonry, Morals and Dogma, he says that Johannism was the name of the secret insider uh, organization or religion called Johannism, and the outer marketing uh, option given to the public is called Roman Catholicism. Now why do we use Albert Pike as an example? Well, here are some of his titles. His titles included Sovereign Grand Commander of the Supreme Council of the 33rd Degree, which is the Mother Council of the World. He was Supreme Pontiff of, the universal, of Universal Freemasonry, scholar, student of ancient languages, occult philosopher. He completely rewrote the degrees of Scottish Rite into their present form. The work explained in his book, Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. His position in Masonry was and is today unparalleled, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. This is the man who, who, if you want to know what's going on in Freemasonry, you speak to Albert Pike. He says, Roman Catholicism is the outsider marketing plan given to the members, to the cattle, to the catechumen. They call us the catechumen, the goyim. To make them feel comfortable that they can continue doing something that seems to be right. Meantime, they are part of an insider esoteric hidden group called Johannism. You'll see on many of his documents and other papers issued in the, in the Freemasonry environment, you'll see that logo or that motto we discussed yesterday, Ordo Ab Kao. You'll see it there where the double-headed eagle is, Ordo Ab Kao, order out of chaos. Interestingly, that above that you'll see the triangle, the 33 degree inside it, or the number 33 with the sun shining out of it. This is the representation of the Luciferian all-seeing eye, but we'll get into that just now. Also, the double-headed eagle representing the double-faced God, the God that faces this way and that. Janusz was also the God that faced this way and that. It also represents the one that can do good and evil. The one can be male and female. That's only Lucifer that can do that. Also, if you go into the, uh, the more senior temples, you'll see on some of the stained glass windows, IHS, which is similar to what you would see in a Roman Catholic cathedral or in a church. IHS, which we are taught today, the outsider, the exoteric people, or members are taught in his service. That's what it means. What it actually stands for, Isis, Horus, and Set, three of the gods of the ancient rites of Egypt. In the digest of Masonic law, it is said that masonry has nothing to do with the Bible. It is not founded upon the Bible, for if it were, it would not be masonry, it would be something else. Many Freemasons come to me and say to me, well, uh, I feel quite comfortable being involved in Freemasonry because it's a Christian organization. Well, they might be telling you that at whatever level you are. But if you are of the lower masons, even the middle masons, even some of the upper masons don't have a clue what they're part of. These, this is the reason why I'm quoting from their documentation, so that you know what you really p find yourself as, as part of at the moment. Manly Palmer Hall, who was a 33rd degree Freemason, in the book The Lost Keys of Freemasonry on page 65, he says, a true mason is not creed-bound. 
Christ, Buddha or Muhammad, the name means little for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in the temple, mosque, cathedral, realizing with his truer understanding of the oneness of all spiritual truth. So for a true Freemason, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or a Buddhist or a, or a Shintoist or whatever, Hindu, makes no difference because they are all part of the same energy. J.D. Buck explains in his book Mystic Masonry, it is far more important that men should strive to become Christ's than that they should believe that Jesus was Christ. One of the goals of Freemasonry which the lower Masons don't understand is that the system leads you up towards becoming Christ. Or a type of Christ, as it were, and through every incarnation of your life, it's based on the idea of the ability to reincarnate. Through every incarnation and through your life, you can work yourself towards the Godhead. So let's ask the question out straight. Mr. Pike, Albert Pike, you know what's going on in Freemasonry. Can you please tell us, are the lower levels of Masonry misled? Let's look in his book on page 819 and see what it says. The blue degrees, that's the first three, are but the outer court of the portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry, the whole body of the royal and sacerdotal art was hidden so carefully centuries since. Where? In the higher degrees. This is an admission from Albert Pike saying that if you really want to know what's going on, you've got to get to the top of the system. The lower levels don't really have a, have a clue. They are intentionally misled and it's done by using symbols. And the reason they do that is you've got to go back into the Bible to Genesis 11, where the Tower of Babel was being built, and God said, one world, one language, one system, no, many nations, many tongues, no Tower of Babel. From that point on, mankind had a, had a bit of a problem. They could no longer converse using languages. And Satan was very angry at this, and from that point, and I'll show you the quotes just now, that's believed in Freemasonry that the Tower of Babel builder Nimrod was the first Freemason. And that from that moment onward, no longer being able to use speech, they would communicate their secret insider doctrines by using symbols. And that's why symbols will become so, so important throughout the rest of these lectures. Let's have a look back into Morals and Dogma at what Albert Pike says on page 104 to 105. Masonry, like all the religions, all the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy, conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages, or the elect, and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it, Truth is not for those who are unworthy or unable to receive it, or would prefer it. So masonry jealously conceals its secrets and intentionally leads conceited interpreters astray. Not only does he admit here that masonry, like all other religions, so masonry is a religion, it conceals what it's really about, and it hides it in the high degrees in what they call the sages or the adepts. And it conceals the truth from people who will just pervert it. One of the most well-marketed aspects of Freemasonry is that it's a whites-only, male-only secret society. Well, here's an image of Mrs. Elizabeth Aldworth in full Masonic regalia. A whites-only, male-only organization? Not necessarily. Here's uh, an image of Ani Basant, who was a 33-degree Freemason, and we'll get to find out what that is very soon. A 33-degree Freemason, and they call her brother Ani Basant. 
See, this is a continuation of ancient Pharaoh times, where when the, the Pharaoh, who was always had to be male, was for a time female, they would draw her with a beard. In today's world, the females within Freemasonry, when they get to the levels, they call her Brother Anibasant. What about black people and dark-skinned people? Are they allowed in Freemasonry? Oh, absolutely. It's not well known, but Prince Hall Freemasonry is the, the Freemasonry and the various rungs you can go through as a black person. Here are images of, uh, f from Florida and Rhode Island. You've got David L. Wright as the, the Grand Master. Here on the right-hand side, you've got the worthy Grand Matron Martha M. Claiborne and worthy Grand Patron Albert L. Middleton. These are black people within Freemasonry. If you didn't know this, and that woman can be a 33rd degree Freemason, a lady, well, if you didn't know that, then what else don't you know? You see, Charles G. Burgess says that the symbols became to have two meanings. The esoteric and the exoteric. The one for the hidden group inside and the one for the masses outside. The esoteric meaning was the true or original meaning understood only by a few and closely guarded by them. The exoteric meaning was the invented or modified explanation intended for the many. These sacred mysteries were often merely continuations of simpler forms of early sex worship carried on by a select few. Encyclopedia of Freemasonry on page 52 and 53 says, The all-seeing eye is one of these symbols. It is an all-important symbol of the supreme being borrowed by the Freemasons from the nations of antiquity. On the same principle, the Egyptians represented Osiris, their chief deity, by the symbol of an open eye and placed their hieroglyphic of him on all their temples. So the eye, the, either the left eye or the right eye, became the symbol in ancient uh, times, in ancient Egypt. And not only was it a symbol of Osiris, who we'll find out who that is in one of the later lectures about death, we'll find out who Osiris is. But not only was this his symbol, the one eye, they put that eye on all the temples. Why then would you find this symbol on a Mason temple? Why would you find the all-seeing eye as the symbol inside Freemasonry? Who does that symbolize? Well, they tell us that it symbolizes Osiris. Robert also explains in his America's Secret Destiny that to the ancient Egyptians, the right eye symbolized the sun and the left eye the moon. Do you remember the symbol that we looked at yesterday inside, or the secret uh, sun worship symbols inside Roman Catholicism, where they take the Eucharist, which has got that big sun around it, and they put it inside the crescent moon? Well, the right eye and the left eye symbolize exactly that. They symbolize the sun and the moon. This is the repetition of the same ancient sun worship rituals. Encyclopedia of Freemasonry on page 114 says that Baal, whenever the Israelites made one of their almost periodical deflections to idolatry, Baal seems to have been the favorite idol to whose worship they addicted themselves. In Tyre, Baal was the sun, and Ashtaroth the moon. Baal Peor, the lord of priapism, was the sun represented as the generative principle of nature and identical with the phallus of other religions. Baal Gad was the lord of the multitude of stars, that is, the sun as the chief of the heavenly host. In brief, Baal seems to have been, wherever the cultus was active, a development of the old sun worship. How does sun worship fit into Freemasonry? We'll find out now. But what you'll see often is you've got the compass and you've got the set square, and inside the set square you will have the G. Now they'll tell the, the goyim, the lower order, the cattle, the catechumen, they'll tell them that means God, G for God. No, the truth is G stands for generative principle. It's a fulfillment of an ancient pagan, uh, pagan sex rite, where generative principle was also pointing towards sun worship, as is the obelisk pointing towards the sun and the combination of the two being the phallic sex worship and the continuation of these reproductive rites. So let's ask, who is the God of Masonry? 
Mr. Pike, could you please tell us, who is your God? As a 33rd degree Freemason, who do you worship? From his book on page 321 in Morals and Dogma, it says, Lucifer the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to be given to the spirit of darkness, Lucifer the son of the morning. It is he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable blinds feeble, sensual or selfish souls. Well, doubt it not. In the next quotation you can see how he expands on this idea. That which we must say to a crowd is we worship a God, but it is the God that one adores without superstition. So this is what they market publicly. To you, sovereign grand inspectors general, this is the insider group, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, the 31st, and the 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates, of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. So according to Albert Pike, who is allowed to know it? The 30th degree, the 31st degree, and the 32nd degree. And you'll notice that he says, you may repeat this. Not, you will repeat this. James Shaw is, a, is an example of a 32nd degree Freemason that had no idea what he was part of until he went through the Shriner initiation. We'll get to that just now. Albert Pike says that, Yes, Lucifer is God. And unfortunately, Adonai is also God. Notice that he says Lucifer is God with a capital G and Adonai is God with a small g. Thus, the true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. But Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. So this is what it's about. Who is the God of Freemasonry? Lucifer. And he's at war between, or at war with Adonai, struggling over humanity. This is exactly the same as what the Bible says. It's just saying it from the other side. The Bible says that Adonai, or God, Michael, Jesus, he who is what God is, is struggling against the God of darkness, the prince of this world. Here they are saying, Lucifer, true and almighty God, is struggling against Adonai, the God of darkness. They just turn everything upside down. Same as what they do with the cross. They turn it upside down. They take the truth and they make the God of the Bible the God of of Masonic darkness. Here's an image of that triangle with the all-seeing eye behind it or in the eye inside the triangle with a sun symbol around it. This is found on a Roman Catholic pulpit in France. What is it doing there? Here's an image from Russia where the all-seeing eye inside that triangle with the sun symbol around it is the one who's sending down the blessing onto Jesus Christ. This is the one to be claiming to be God who's sending down the Holy Spirit. Well, we know who the all-seeing eye is. The one side is Osiris as the one type of God. This is certainly not our God, the Yahweh of the Bible. An image also out of the Catholic Church, this image of the wandering bishops. And you'll see the gentleman on the right-hand side in the red with his two fingers across his chest. We'll get to explain exactly who that is very shortly. But you'll see on their uh, tiaras, on their caps that they wear, you'll see on the bottom there, the all-seeing eye with the sun symbol around it again, inside the triangle. Here's another one in a confessional in a cathedral of Milano, Italy. Let's stop for a moment in Freemasonry. How does Freemasonry involve itself in this Islamic worship, is it possible? Well, James Shaw was a 33 degree Freemason. He was actually a 32nd degree Freemason, and then he was invited in to become a Shriner 33 degree Freemason. Remembering that the shrine of Freemasonry is in opposition to the sanctuary or the temple of God, the shrine pointing east and the sanctuary pointing west. To become a Shriner Freemason, you obviously have to point your worship to the east. Now this James Shaw was a Christian at the time when he came to realize that he was actually busy with what he was actually busy with. And during his 
33 degree Freemasonry initiation or the ceremony, there were certain people that came in attendance. One of the people that was watching or that was part of the ceremony in the audience of the ceremony was a certain gentleman by the name of Billy Graham. Being part of an audience of a 33 degree Freemasonry ceremony, well you can only be a 33 degree Freemason if you are part of the audience. No one of the lower orders is allowed to be there. James Shaw wrote the book The Deadly Deception and he tried to explain that this was the case that Billy Graham was at his ceremony but he couldn't get his work published. And it was only until he changed the words Billy Graham was in attendance to there was a prominent evangelist in attendance that his book became published. And today it's freely available. You can go and pick it up from the bookstore, from Amazon. You can have a look. The Deadly Deception by James D. Shaw. Amazon, you can have a look. The Deadly Deception by James D. Shaw. Well, let's look into this book. What happens in a 33 degree Freemasonry ceremony? The 33rd degree initiation ceremony, the oath is sealed by drinking wine out of a human skull. May this wine I now drink become a deadly poison to me as the hemlock juice drunk by Socrates, should I ever knowingly or willfully violate the same. A member dressed as a skeleton places his arms around the candidate who then states, and may these cold arms forever encircle me, should I ever knowingly or willingly violate the same. This is the ceremony which is done to to initiate a person into the 33rd degree, saying that if I was to violate this oath, may my death be done by poison, or like the hemlock that Socrates drank, or may death encircle me. So this is a, an oath to death, an oath of secrecy. He continues and he says, Each of us was presented, along with a Scottish Rite ring, a copy of Albert Pike's book, Moral and Dogma. We were told that it was the source book of Freemasonry and, that, and its meaning. We were also told that it must never leave our possession and that arrangements must be made so that upon our deaths it would be returned to the Scottish Rite. When did James Shaw receive morals and dogma? When he became a 33 degree Freemason. He was at the 32nd level and he still hadn't received this book. Only once he was invited to become a 33 degree Shrine of Freemason was he able to read this book, Morals and Dogma. And it was only at that point that he was told, this is the source book of all Freemasonry. And you're not allowed to uh, pass it through the family upon your death. On your death, it goes back into the system. The Scottish Rite includes 29 degrees, he explains. Well, those are beyond the first three degrees, beyond the Blue Lodge. Master Mason being that third degree, thinking, oh, I'm a master Freemason. Well, you've got 29 degrees to go till you find out what's going on. He says that the York Rite has the equivalent of 29 degrees of the Scottish Rite and the advancement upon this path culminates, listen here, in the degree Knight Templar. In addition, the Shrine, which is the ancient Arabic order, nobles of the mystic shrine, is available to the 32nd degree Masons and Knights Templars who wish to participate. So as you work your way through Freemasonry, when you get to the top, you become part of the Knights Templar orientation. And do you remember what they believed? They, the, they were the ones that spat on the cross. They the, were the ones that set up the system of secret insider Johannism and public Goyam Catholicism. Well, not only did he, can you become a Knight Templar, but at the 33rd degree you, beca you are invited to become a Shriner Mason. The shrine, he says, which is the ancient Arabic order, nobles of the mystic shrine. He says the shrine, the show army of masonry, maintains a very high profile. It is necessary to be a 32nd degree Freemason for six months before being eligible to join the shrine. Now listen what happens in the ceremony. That's the background. Now he's going through the ceremony, and he's a Christian, and he now bows down for the ceremony. Read with me what it says. With the Koran on the altar, we sealed our solemn oath in the name of Allah, the God of the Arab, Muslim, and Mohammedan, the God of our fathers. Isn't that amazing? At the 33rd degree, they seal their oath on the Koran. Up to there, any of the religious books is suitable, but at the top, the Quran is the book on which they seal the faith. He says, every shriner near, kneeling before the Quran takes this oath in the name of Allah and acknowledges this pagan god of vengeance as his own. 
And in the ritual, he acknowledges Islam, the declared blood enemy of Christianity, as the one true path. How does Islam at the top in the shrine of Freemasonry, how does it link together? Well, let's just go inside the temple and have a look at the Shriner Freemasons themselves. Let's look at the cap they put on, the Shriner hat. Well, here you have a depiction of it, of what's written on it is Mosla, Muslim Allah, the God of Freemasonry according to Allah, according to uh, Albert Pike in our first half of this lecture. He said, Lucifer, he is the God of Freemasonry. Now when you become a 33rd degree Freemason, you bow down and you seal your oath on the Quran, which is obviously Allah being the God. So what does Albert Pike say about this word Allah or Yahweh reversed? Let's find out. He says in page 102 of Morals and Dogma, the true name of Satan, the Kabbalists say, is Yahweh or God reversed. So in typical fashion, just like they turn the cross upside down, they take the name of God, Yahweh, which is a biblical name, and they turn it upside down. They fiddle with it and they, they invert it. Well, let's have a look at this. If you take the name of God, Yahweh, in the original writing, it is written like that. If you turn it inside out in reverse writing, you write it like that. You turn it upside down in occult fashion, you squeeze it all together, and amazingly enough, in Arabic, that spells Allah. In perfect symmetry with the Bible saying don't get involved in things which are to do with sun worship, where Allah is the sun and he marries the moon goddess. And in perfect symmetry with uh, Albert Pike that says that Allah is or the God of, of uh, Freemasonry being Satan, his name is Allah when you seal your oath on the, on the um, on the altar as a 33 degree Freemason. This is the inversion of the biblical Yahweh. And it was only at that point that James Shaw came to realize what he was really busy with. Manny Palmer Hall explains in his book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. He says, when the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mastery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply the energy. See, this is where once you become a 33 degree Freemason and you understand that Allah is Lucifer, and you understand that Lucifer is the God of Freemasonry, and that he, by having acknowledged him as God, you become able to channel this energy. It's only at that point that you realize what you're really busy with. And this would all be funny ha-ha if it weren't that the top people in the world belong to the system. I'll get into some presidents in later lectures. I'll show you who are some of the presidents that are 33 degree Freemasons. This is an image here of a, a lodge meeting in Cairo in 1940 in Egypt. This is under the portrait of King Farouk I. Here's even the President Gamal Abdul Nasser, 1954 to 1970, and Muhammad Anwar Sadat from 1970 onwards to 1981. They were all members of this order of Shriner Freemasons. These people understand that the seething power of Lucifer now runs through their hands and through their bones, and they've got to work with this energy. This is a judge, Rageb Idris, who's a 33-degree Freemason, a Grand Master Sovereign and Commander of Egypt. He runs the entire system there. And there's his fez, once again, the, 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 the Shriner hat at least, with the symbol of Allah on it, the symbol of Islam, the sun and the moon. And it doesn't matter if the symbol is with a star on top or with the star at the bottom. That's the right eye, left eye, male, female, good, evil. That's the God, which is not our biblical God. That is a God of this planet, the, the ruler of this planet, Lucifer, or now as we know him, Satan. Okay, so when the President of the United States is a high Freemason, in other words, he's serving the God of the 33rd degree of Freemasonry. Who is he serving? 
Adonai or Lucifer? God or Satan? At the 33rd degree and thereabouts, he's serving Satan. And that's why when you see George Washington, you'll see him in his Masonic regalia. Here you have him on the left with the all-seeing eye of Lucifer over the Capitol Hill. And holding also his, uh, the building tools where it says the, father, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man. And on the right, you've got another image of him with his Masonic regalia on. This is actually George Washington's personal Masonic apron. You see the sun symbol on there? And if you were to join those stars underneath the eye of Lucifer, you would have the Star of David, which is a symbol of the sun worship. Underneath that, you've got the compass and set square. And at the bottom, the black and white squares. And below that, the coffin, the order of death, also hinting towards this oath that they take where the cold arms envelop them and they say, may I look after these um, secrets until death. Now, are there any Freemasons at the top of the United States system? Absolutely. Well, George Washington was one of them, as you've just seen. Here's another one, Harry S. Truman. President Truman joined the Masons in 1909. On October 19, 1945, he was coronated a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemason. Now, at the 33rd degree, do you know who you're worshipping? Yes, you do. So here are two presidents that we know of that were Luciferic worshippers. Who else was there that were high Freemasons? Well, I haven't written down all of them. They, they are all available if you do the research, but here's just a couple. George Washington, James Monroe, Andrew Jackson, James K. Polk, James Buchanan, Andrew Johnson, James Garfield, William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, Howard Taft, Warren Harding, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Harry Truman, as we've seen, Lyndon Johnson, Gerald Ford, George H.W. Bush, and George Bush today, William Clinton. And not only is George Bush a high Freemason, he's also a member of Skull and Bones, which we have explained is an order of death, where they do secret things, and it's pretty horrific. Let's have a look at the George Washington Masonic National Memorial. Here's an image of it. As you can see, it looks like it's got an obelisk in front. The steeple forms a type of obelisk form. 101 Callahan Drive, Alexandria. This is the interesting that they would put this Masonic uh, National Memorial in Alexandria. Do you remember Alexandria in ancient times where that comes from? Well, that's the, the house of paganism, the place where they had all the occult writings in one place. The Alexandrian library that burned down. Well, here in the suburb of Alexandria, they built this national memorial. It's also explained in the grand design, exposed that the truth is that the Jesuits of Rome have perfected Freemasonry to be their most magnificent and effective tool accomplishing their purposes amongst Protestants. So how do these world wars fit together? For that, we've got to go back to the top of the organization. Always got to go back to the highest, highest sources. Albert Pike, who's a 33rd degree Freemason, he was, who was the most famous and most influential Freemason of all time. He wrote a letter to Mazzini, dated August 15, 1871, in which he outlined the plans for three world wars that were seen, he had to have three in order to bring about the one world order. This letter was on display for a short time at the British Museum Library in London. It was copied by William Guy Carr, former intelligence officer of, in the Royal Canadian Navy, before it was then taken away. What was written in this letter to Mazzini? It states the following, that there will be three world wars required to drive the world towards a one world order. Not only that, this will bring in the ability to control the world under a single government. Well, we know that the First World War, according to this letter, was to overthrow the power of the Tsars in Russia, the protector of the orthodoxy, and bring about an atheistic communist state. That was what was written in 1871 by Albert Pike. The First World War was to overthrow the power of the Tsars in Russia. Did that happen? Absolutely. Did it bring about a communistic state? Communist state? Absolutely. This letter says that there will be a second war and it will originate between the Great Britain and Germany to strengthen communism as an antithesis to Judeo-Christian culture and bring about the Zionist state in Israel. Did that happen? Absolutely. 
What about number three? This letter written in 1871 states that there will be a third world war and it will be a Middle Eastern war involving Judaism and Islam and spreading internationally. Isn't that incredible? It hasn't happened yet, but you just have to watch the noises with Iran and the Middle East and something to do with Islam and terrorism how this might possibly be the fulfillment of this Hegelian principle, the final third world war that they're busy building up to at the moment. This has been planned since 1871. It's 138 years, 136 years already that this has been planned. So what about the Capitol Hill? Is there anything interesting about Capitol Hill? Well, I'm going to go into the dome later on in the lecture, but let's just find out what happened at the laying of the cornerstone. Here's the image, as always, you see George Washington with his Masonic regalia on. You can see all the Masons standing around the top edge of the, the, where the cornerstone is being laid, all wearing their Freemason aprons, covering up the, the nakedness from the Garden of Eden. It says the cornerstone of the U.S. Capitol building was laid with Masonic honors on December 18, 1793, under the auspices of the Grand Lodge of Maryland. You see, even the Capitol Hill has to be laid with Masonic honors. You see, if you trace Freemasonry all the way to the top of its orders, James Parton explained, you come to the grand tip-top head mason of the world. You will discover that the dread individual of the chief and the chief of the Society of Jesus are one and the same person. Looking at a temple of Freemasonry, all you have to do is have a look at a close-up just above the door. There you'll see the Masonic chevrons, and you'll see the symbol of the covering cherubs. Except these cherubs have got goat's feet. And above the, the Masonic badge or the, the coat of arms, you've got the Ark of the Covenant with the covering cherubs. Do you remember who the covering cherub was? It was Lucifer in heaven and he fell down to earth. Here he's claiming to be the, one of the covering cherubs, but this time with the goat's feet. Where have you seen this structure before? This uh, pyramid with the capstone that's slightly raised up or away. Can you remember? Well, here's the image. Novus Ordo Seclorum. It comes from the one dollar bill. You'll see it there. There it is on the bottom left. One dollar bill in God we trust. The God of the all-seeing eye at the top of the triangle. Right? You also notice in that pyramid of Novos Ordo Seclorum there are 13 levels. Again, this occult reference. If you count the stars and you count this and you count that, you'll see that many, many, many 13s on the one dollar bill. Do you remember what Morals and Dogma spoke to us about? Albert Pike, the highest Freemason of all time, he wrote about the Templars having two doctrines, one secret and one well known. The Templars were also the people who spat on the cross and defecated on the cross of Christ, right? Well, the Templars, like all other societies and secret orders and associations, have two doctrines. One concealed and reserved for the masters, which was Johannism. The other public, which was the Roman Catholic. Moles and Dogma explains to us, this book explains to us that the insider, or, or Johannism, you know, St. John the Divine and these two, is actually the outsider Catholicism. But inside, it's secretly Luciferian. David Spangler, who's the directory or the director of the planetary initiative at the United Nations, he says, no one will enter the new world order unless he or she will make a pledge to worship Lucifer. No one will enter the new age unless he will take a Luciferian initiation. The light that reveals to us the presence of the Christ comes from Lucifer. He is the light giver. He is aptly named the morning star because it is his light that heralds for man the dawn of a great consciousness. Man, these guys are deceptive. Listen to what he says. No one will enter the new world order unless he or she will make a pledge to worship Lucifer. You see what the problem is? Worship. They know it. The highest people know that they are channeling exactly as the Bible says. They follow the beast and they worship the dragon who gave the power to the beast. They are worshipping Lucifer. Revelation 18 verse 1 to 4 is this cry that comes from heaven. After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. 
For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings, that's George Bush and his cojones, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are wax, waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. The most difficult thing for people, especially conspiracy theorists, to get around is the idea of what is the actual reason behind the New World Order. It's not about power. It's not about money. It's about worship. Worship of Jesus Christ versus the worship of Lucifer. Luf Lucifer is just using them. And he's using conspiracy theorists as well. If you do not understand the entire picture of grounding your beliefs back in the Word of God, then you run a risk of getting involved in what I, David Icke thinks about this fourth dimension and the immortality of the soul. I'll leave it there, though there's a lot more to it in the body of the other lectures. Please go and have a look at them. Is Mr. Elwood the reborn Son of God? The returned Christ? My hope is that this video has gone some way towards answering that question for you. Please be wary of deception. Please take the time to have a look at the Bible. God's Word is there to protect and empower you. Thank you for your time, and I wish you all the very best.